Hello and a great welcome once again to each one of you. So today in this particular session, as you can see flashing on your screens, we are going to discuss the set 2 of the model paper. In fact, set 1 we have already completed. So moving over to set 2 on request, although not very tough one, but it's still quite interesting. Correct. So let's have a look over there what's in store for us today. And since each one of you are already having these papers, so if you have these papers, then kindly actually pull it down. And in case if you feel to write, you can write also. Otherwise, I have provided all the answers and answers are also with you. So here we go and pick up section A of this particular model paper. This is set 2 I am talking about. Correct? So section A. In section A, there are 10 questions all in all. And each question carry 2 marks. Total is 20 marks. And this is something which you can score 100 out of 100 out. And there have been 20 out of 20. Choose the correct alternative, provide justification in each case, and one mark is allotted for the correct selection and one mark for justification. Let's see what's the first question is all about. J Limited purchased a plant for US dollar 50,000 on 31st of October 2020, and it is payable after six months. It is payable after six months. And question says that the company entered into a forward contract for six months at the rate of 64.25 per dollar 64.25 per dollar and on 31st of october 2020 the exchange rate was 61.50 and the profit and loss account on forward contract for the year ended 31st of march 2021 this is what the question is actually asking now just pay attention first of all you have to pay great attention towards the dates since your current accounting year is ending on 31st of march 2021 because question has asked exactly this that how much profit you are going to book for the year ended 31st of march 2021 so your current accounting year must have begun on 1st of april 2021 on 1st of april 2021 and on 31st of October, on 31st of October, pay attention, 31st of October, 31st of October, 2020, sorry, your accounting year must have begun on 1-4-2020, so that is why on 31st of October, just allow me one minute, 31st of October, 2021, we entered into a contract with a foreign company, because with a US company, you may say so, J Limited purchased a plant for US dollar 50,000. So on this date, we purchased a plant, and the value of the plant in dollars is equal to 50,000, as you can see. Further question says that we entered into an agreement with them that we are going to make the payment after 30, after six months. We are going to make you payment after six months. Now suppose if I would start computing months after this particular this particular date, after 31st October we will have November, then we will enter into December, then January, then February, and then ultimately March and finally April. Why I have written April over here? Because these months will fall in the current accounting year. Yani indirectly, what I am trying to tell you is that out of six months, five months would fall in the current accounting year and one month would fall, of course, in the next year. Because question is asking us how much profit we are going to book for the year ended 31st of March 2021. We need to be very, very careful regarding the time phase with respect to the current period, especially after the date of agreement. Now the question says that the company entered into a forward contract for six months at the rate of uh, rupees 64.25 per dollar. That means what was the contract? Contract, contract is that, that we are going to pay you after six months, but we will make the payment at the rate of 64.25 per dollar. We are going to make you, we are going to make you pay in of, of course rupee terms but we are going to take the exchange rate at the rate of 
0.25 rupee per dollar. For every dollar, we will pay you 64.25. That means for $50,000, we would pay you $50,000 into 64.25. Now, this is the agreement actually. On 31st of October 2020, the exchange rate, the date on which we entered into the contract, technically on this date, the exchange rate is rupees 61.50 per dollar. Rupee 61.50 is equal to $1. You can say so. Now, because you are entering into a forward contract, you are not paying 50,000 into 61.50. You would have had paid it if you would have made the payment on this particular date. If you would have had made the payment on this particular date itself, you would have paid this much of the amount. Isn't it or not? However, now you are going to make the payment after six months and the payment will be equal to $50,000 into, into 64.25 because you have already entered into an agreement with the other party that we are going to make the payment at the rate of 64.25. That means the total loss because of forward contract is equal to $50,000 into difference of these two rates. Now, whatever difference of these two rates, that is 64.50 minus 61.50 will be considered as loss for six months. This is your loss of six months. Remember one thing, because after six months, you are going to make the payment. But as I told you, out of these six months, five months would actually fall in the current accounting period. And question is asking actually, how much loss we should book for the what we call current year, 31st of March, 2021. So obviously, out this is six months loss. So out of these five months are falling in the current period. That is why I'm going to take this much of amount. Now you compute this figure, you will get what we call 1,14,583. I have given the answer here in this manner. In fact, this answer is given as per your module. Loss for five months will be this much. Correct? So your correct answer is solution B. Uh, correct option is your B. Is it clear to you? Now, next point is, next question is related to valuation of goodwill. A firm values goodwill under capitalization or profits method. Under capitalization or profits method, an average profit of the firm for the last four years has been determined at rupees 1 lakh before tax. So, average profit is already given to you. And capital employed in the business is 4,80,000 and normal rate of return is 12%. And your tax rate is given to you as 28% on your average profit. Value of goodwill is based on capitalization of average profits will be. Now question is asking this. It is very simple actually. Very simple question. First of all, your average profits are given to you in this particular case. Whatever average profits you are being given, out of those average profits, first of all, what you are going to do is you are going to simply subtract the amount of tax because not, because no further information is given. So you are going to subtract the amount of tax. Your tax rate will be equal to 28%. Now, whatever tax rate will be there at the rate of 28%. Now, this is your average profit after tax. This will be your average profit after tax. Whatever profit you will get after subtracting the tax that will be considered average profit after tax. Then you will have to divide it by 12%. If you will divide your average profit by 12%, this is your normal rate of return. Then you will get the capitalized value of the profit. You will get the capitalized value of the profit. It is known as capitalized value you will get the capitalized value of the profit. Whatever capitalized value of profit you will get now, actually, what is the capitalized value? So often I have told you actually, even during my lectures on goodwill, capitalized value simply reflects the market value of your capital. Your book capital, that means capital as per your books might be different, but it will reflect what we call your market value of the capital. Correct? And from here on, now you simply subtract your current capital employed. Your current capital employed is already given to you in the question that is equal to 4,80,000. So now you can get the amount of goodwill through capitalization provided your capitalized value is more than what we call your current capital employed. This will be your goodwill. Is it clear to you or not? This is what exactly here I have done. See here, first of all, I have computed 
I have taken average profit subtracted 28% of 1 lakh. We will get 72,000 as our average profit after tax. And I told you, we will divide it by 12%, 12% or 0.12 are one and same thing. So here I have written 72,000 divided by 0.12. So capitalization of profit means this is the capitalized value which we are getting. Correct? However, our actual capital employed is 480,000. The capital employed which is given in the question reflects your actual capital employed. That means actually you are having a capital employed of 480, but because of your superior profit earning capacity, you are having a market value of your capital higher than your actual capital. So market value of your capital is 6 lakhs, so difference will be equal to 120,000. Correct? This is how you are going to compute in it. The next one is car limited absorbs bar limited and shares are issued by car limited using the swap ratio 3 is to 7 first of all you need to understand in this particular question especially under intrinsic value method while doing the business combination we have talked a lot about what we call swap ratios correct there is a company car limited and this company is taking over bar limited correct now this company is telling to Bar Limited that we will swap the shares in the ratio of 3 is to 7. What does it mean? Swap. We will swap the share in the ratio of 3 is to 7. It means for every 3 share, first of all you need to understand the meaning of this. It means for every 3 shares of B Limited, correct? For, uh, sorry, for every 7 shares, of B limited we will issue because it is written first this shows that number of share which would be issued by K limited it shows the number of share which will be issued by K limited to shareholders of B limited what does it mean that for for every seven share this is seven for every seven shares of B limited car limited shall issue shall issue three shares this is what we mean by swap ratio now suppose if you are the shareholder of b limited and you are having seven share then our company will give you only three shares is it clear to you further the question says that the face value of the share is 10 each for both the companies we are not concerned with the face value question we are more interested in the intrinsic value of purchasing company now purchasing company is car limited or acquirer company should i say actually the intrinsic value of each share of car limited is 40. now we know and we have done under intrinsic value of share concept this is the intrinsic value of share intrinsic value of share reflects that in case if k limited will get liquidated how much worth of asset can back the face value of one share for example face value of one share is 10 and we have the backing of 14 asset rupees 14 worth of asset to back rupee 10 worth of share that with the position of this particular company is highly strong is it clear bar limited now all we need to know is that how many shares the acquiry company is having acquiry company is having 70,000 shares now everything is clear to us in the sense that acquiry company has total number of shares 70,000. As per the agreement, for every share divided by 7, K Limited will offer only 3 shares. That means if you are having 7 shares, we will give you only 3 shares. So total number of share which would be issued by K Limited to B Limited will be this much. That will be equal to 30,000. We will issue you 30,000 shares but at the same time we will issue shares at the rate of intrinsic value of our share the intrinsic value of our share that mean k limited is this much so this will be the amount of your purchase consideration is it clear to you or not this is how you are going to do this particular question so number of share to be issued is equal to 30,000 I have already shown that how we need to compute it and purchase consideration will be equal to 420 so your answer A then fourth one is Peta Limited declares the following information. Peta Limited declares the following information. We purchased goods on this particular date. Correct? So often I have already told you when we purchase the goods, our entry will be purchases account debit to foreign creditors account because we are purchasing the goods from 
abroad and we purchased goods dollar 1 lakh worth of goods we purchased and on this date 1 dollar is equal to rupees 76.76 so this is the amount which we are going to record here on the date of purchased when we reach the end of the accounting year see we are not going to actually touch the amount of purchases because we have to take into account only monetary nature items monetary item all balance sheet items are generally monetary items barring fixed assets correct fixed asset inventories or share capital these are not considered as what we call monetary items generally 99.99 percent items are monetary items and i have explained at great length under as in as 21 what we mean by monetary item and non-monetary monetary item in case if you want to refer you can refer to that particular standard but at the same time, foreign creditors are, is a what we call monetary item. Now, on the balance sheet date, what we will do here, we will have to see to it, we'll pass an entry. Now, this value has come down. So, it is a gain to us now this time. Because it is a gain, our foreign creditor or liability will, dec will decrease. So, foreign creditors account debit to profit and loss account. There will be what we call gain because of differences in the exchange rate now we are supposed to pay only one lakh dollars at the rate of rupees 75.91 so that is why there is a gain correct we have to pay only this much whereas we have recorded the liability at dollar one lakh into rupees 76.76 but when we will reach the end of the accounting year that is 31st of March 2022 we will have a gain of this much because we have recorded the liability on the date of purchase of goods at this particular amount however now on this particular date we are supposed to pay only this much so the difference will be equal to dollar one lakh dollar one lakh in to take the difference of these two figures that is 76.76.76 minus 75.91 so this much of gain you are going to book on this particular date is it clear to you question is asking us what will be your gain or loss in the year 2021-22 so exchange gain for the year will be as i've already told you one lakh into the difference between these two figures and this will come to 85,000. So 85,000, if there is something here given over here, that is fine, otherwise none of the above. Correct, so in this case, none of the above will be the correct answer because nowhere 85,000 is written. Part five, on 1st of January 2021, A Limited acquires 80% of the equity interest of B Limited for rupees 560 lakhs. Now, so far, the question actually runs like this, that there is an entity A Limited and A Limited on 1st of January, let us say 1st of January is somewhere falling here, on 1st of January 2021, this will be considered as date of acquisition. On this date, we acquired 80% of the equity interest and for that, we paid a consideration of 560 lakhs. 560 lakhs. Further, the question says that the identifiable assets are measured at 960 lakhs and liabilities assumed are measured at 160 lakhs. So, on this date, net identifiable asset, net identifiable assets, because I have used the word net, so assets are equal to 960 lakhs, identifiable asset, and liability is equal to 160 lakhs. So, net identifiable asset is equal to 800 lakhs of the acquiring company. On the date of acquisition, net identifiable asset of acquiring company were 800 lakhs. The non-controlling interest in B Limited is measured at fair value. The question says that and further question is asking us, compute the gain on bargain purchase. In order to compute the gain on bargain purchase, so often I have told you, 
First of all, we note down very carefully the amount of net identifiable assets of acquiry company on the date of acquisition, which is 800 lakhs. And now, we have to divide this 800 lakhs between NCI and parent. Parent basically means acquirer. Because we have acquired, that is acquirer, 80% control. So logically NCI is equal to 20%. But this time I cannot take 20% of this. It means I would be computing NCI on proportional share of net asset spaces. Because in this question, it is clearly written that NCI will be measured at fair value. So often I have already told you, NCI can be measured on the basis of proportionate share of net assets basis. Normally, we measure NCI on proportionate share of net assets basis only because generally it is not given in the question that you have to measure NCI at fair value. Suppose if I would have been computing NCI on this methodology, then it would have been 20% of 800 because share of NCI is 20% and net asset is equal to this. However, in this question, it is irrelevant. We have to compute NCI at fair value. So first of all, I need to find out the fair value of the NCI. How can I find out? See, acquirer company has paid 80 for 80% 80 of shares. We have paid 560 lakhs. 560 lakhs. To whom we have paid? To the acquiry company. If I am paying 80, if I am paying 80 per, for 80%, 80 560 lakhs, suppose if I would have had acquired only 20% shares, then how much we would have had paid? So quite obviously you can compute it in this manner, 20 into 560 divided by 80. So this will tell you the fair value. Now suppose if I am going to compute the fair value in this particular case, that will be equal to 560 into 20 divided by 80 that is equal to 140 so it comes to 140 so that means the fair value of 20 percent holding is equal to 140 as per fair value basis so in this question nci will be considered as commanding a value of 140 so in other words we may say out of 800 140 worth of asset will belong to nci now you subtract 140 from 800, that will tell you the share of acquirer in the net identifiable assets of subsidiary company or acquiry company, correct? So if I subtract 140 from 800, we will get 660. This 660 shows, but don't and never take directly 80% of this, otherwise the things will go wrong. Is it clear to you or not? So 660 is share of acquirer in the net identifiable assets of your acquiry company on the date of acquisition. That means on the date of acquisition, you have acquired this much of stakes in the net assets. And for that, you have paid a consideration of 560 lakhs. So because your share acquired are higher in comparison to your consideration paid, so difference of 100 will be considered as gain on bargain purchase. Is it clear to you? So this will be your answer. If you want to solve it in this manner, otherwise I have simply written first of all in this manner, fair value of net identifiable asset 960 minus 160, 800 lakhs. Purchase consideration 560 lakh, it's fine. First of all, we need to find out NCI value at fair value. So NCI at fair value will be equal to 140 lakhs, correct? Now, because you have found out NCI, now we can compute the gain on bargain purchase from net identifiable asset. First of all, I will have to subtract NCI share. Now, we will, we will, we will be left up with 660. This 660 shows the share of parent in the net assets. Is it clear to you? Share of acquirer in the net assets. That is 660 and consideration paid 560. So, rupees 100 lakh will be your answer. 6th part relates to government accounting. Question says that GASB stands for, that's all, and provide justification for your selection. Those among you who have gone through what we call GASAB or government accounting standard, and I keep on saying even during the lectures that your government accounting standards are absolutely vital. 
So you can easily find out that your option A will be the correct answer in this case that is Government Accounting Standard Advisory Board. Now you have to tell what exactly is this that Government Accounting Standard Board was constituted by the Comptroller Auditor General of India with the support of the Government of India through a notification dated on 12th of August 2020. 2002 sorry and this board was constituted to establish and improve the standard of the governmental accounting and financial reporting and enhance the accountability mechanism correct so as is the case in the normal in the normal corporate markets IASB the international body and in India I in India ASB accounting standard board are responsible similarly as far as government sector is concerned it is GASAB which is responsible to frame the what we call government accounting standard and to improve the what we call standards of government reporting then as far as seventh is concerned it is related to external benefits of sustainability reporting external benefits of such sustainability reporting include and why Actually, sustain, sustainability reporting, ESG, government accounting, these are theoretical chapters. The problem is that sometimes we ignore them. So, if I have already told you, basically from your theoretical chapters, especially chapters with one or two pages in your module, it is given clearly. Lots of MCQs would be asked. Even during my lectures, I have told very clearly that you can expect only objective sort of questions out of these chapters. So sustainability reporting, it all deals with environment. We need, we are trying to actually sustain this particular environment and options. But first of all, you need to know as far as external benefits of sustainability reporting are concerned. One is mitigating. Mitigating means to wipe out or reversing the negative environmental, social, government impacts and improving reputation and brand loyalty these are what we call these are considered as chief objective or chief benefits rather so in this question we have been given a mitigating or reversing negative environmental social and government impacts improving reputation and brand brand loyalty any entity nowadays which works to sustain the what we call uh, this environment planet or environment Naturally, nowadays investors not only give priority to the profit earning capacity of the company before investing, they also take into account what this company is doing for the society as a whole and especially to safeguard this planet and sustain the human life. So that is the reason of late the concept of sustainability reporting, ESC, etc. are have gone got up by leaps and bounds and that is the reason these chapters have been included as a part of your syllabi. So, and even this is enhanced perception on organization's value. This is what exactly I was trying to tell you. Suppose you are the investor of a particular company. Quite obviously, your first and top priority will be how much this particular uh, particular entity is earning. But at the same time, being a good soul, you need to actually see to it that only profit earning capacity is not enough. What this company is doing for the society as a whole. So if you suddenly find that this particular company is doing something for the society, for the environment and to safeguard the what we call uh, this environmental issues. So quite obviously in your eyes, the perception of perception of this organization image will enhance. So this is yet another what we call benefit. In fact, answer will be all of the ever. Is it clear to you? Point number eight. India's 103 states that acquire or obtaining control over acquiry recognizes and measures in its consolidated financial statement at the acquisition date and justify your answer. We have seen actually while explaining the initial concept in the very first session I have told about this particular fact that on that what are the accounting steps and I told you that on the date of acquisition the acquirer is supposed to identify all the assets acquired and of course the liabilities assumed and measure them at fair value. Besides that, we have to find out what is the what we call non-controlling interest, how much is their interest, and we have to measure the non-controlling interest. In just a moment, I told you, actually here the option is given to, given to the company. They can measure the what we call NCI either at fair value or what we call on proportionate share of net assets basis. And besides on the date of acquisition, we need to find out actually whether there is goodwill or gain on 
bargain purchase, isn't it or not? So these are the steps we need, which we need to follow on the date of acquisition to do the accounting. In fact, all the th all these three steps have been written over here. Identifiable asset acquired and the liabilities assumed at fair value, any non-controlling interest in the acquiry at fair value or at proportionate value, and the goodwill acquired in the business combination or gain on bargain purchase. So all of the above will be your answer in this particular case. Clear? The second one here, it is written that as per Appendix C of India 103, if you remember actually, remember many people actually confuse here a lot Appendix are not considered as the principal part of the AS. Remember one thing, first of all, Appendix just is supplementation of some information to improve the quality of accounting in case if some confusion is arises. It is not considered as the principal part of what we call India's. Remember one thing. So as per India's C of C of India's 103, accounting and reporting for business combination under common control is done. I have already told you basically under India S3, we adopt acquisition method, but acquisition method is adopted when, when it is not a case of common control and 99.99% it never happens to be a case of common control. Very rarely case of common control takes place and case of common control, I have already told you is basically known as pooling of interest method. Is it clear to you? Under pooling of interest method, what we do, we take over all the assets and liability at book value. In fact, if there are reserves of the, what we call subsidiary company or acquiry company, we take them over also. So the, this is what we mean by pooling interest method. So Appendix C of India S and three deals with accounting for combination of entities or businesses under common control. And as per this appendix, business combinations involving entities or business under common control shall be accounted for using the pooling of interest method. And I've already, already told you under pooling of interest method, what we do, we take all the assets and liabilities at book value. In fact, that is the chief characteristic in consideration, of course, is measured at nominal value. Intent one is A oblique N dash is a contract that evidences a residual interest in the assets of an entity. I've already told you entire gamut of financial instruments because this is related to financial instrument. Entire wheel of financial instrument revolves around three facets. One financial asset, another financial liability and then there is equity. What is equity? From net assets, if we subtract the liability, whatever interest now remains, that residual interest basically belongs to equity. So that is known as equity instrument. Is it clear to you or not? This is known as equity instrument. An equity instrument is any contract that evidences, that shows a residual interest in the assets of the entity after deducting all of its li liability. That means if you hold equity shares, that means you are holding equity instruments. However, even not only equity share, even preference share capital could be equity. Is it clear to you uh, under what we call NAS? So that is the reason if you are a shareholder of a particular company, quite obviously, whatever assets which would remain after payment of what we call liability in those net assets you have some stakes you have some interest in it correct so that is why such instrument which have the interest in the net assets you can say are known as equity instrument correct now there is some interesting questions coming up under section b and Rest of the section, I will try to finish up in the next session itself. I've already told you nowadays actually time factor plays a very major stake and we have to see to it that every, every, every course student gets some benefit every day. Correct? So that's the reason we are taking a bit shorter version today, but in the next one we'll meet you and we'll try to finish up the rest of the paper. So on such count, we take leave of you and then shall meet you again quite obviously next time, next day.